especially those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority. Daring, self-willed, they do not tremble when they revile angelic majesties, whereas angels who are greater in might and power do not bring a reviling judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like unreasoning animals, born as creatures of instinct to be captured and killed, reviling where they have no knowledge, will in the destruction of those creatures also be destroyed. Well, good morning. Welcome to ABC. Thanks for joining us. If you happen to catch the scripture passage in that video, uh, it's not all that uplifting and cheerful this morning. I hate to share it with you. But we're in a, in a series called Refining the Mind in 2 Peter chapter 2. And last week we kind of took a turn, as Adam shared from the beginning of chapter 2, that we're, we're looking at refining the mind. And certainly chapter 1 we enjoyed this idea of God changing us and molding us and making us in His knowledge. And we enjoy things like kindness and gentleness and we, we grow in self-control and in the knowledge of God and godliness and all these things. And then all of a sudden, Peter switches gears and starts talking about false prophets and it gets real dark. And he's like, I want you to watch out for false teaching and false prophets. And so this morning, we're kind of in week two of a three-week series in false prophets here as we look at what Peter has to say. But it's really, really important because I think as we look at what God is trying to get our attention with this morning, we're going to realize there may be more false teaching in our world than we think. And so I want to give you just a quick little disclaimer, by the way. Um, we're going to share some statistics and things a little bit later that are kind of PG-13. And so if you've got kids that you're concerned about, just hearing some of the words um, that we're going to read through, just want to bring your attention to that. And uh, we have our children's program going right now during the service. So, But anyways, as we get into it, Peter's going to contrast this life con- with uh, life lived in truth with the rude awakening of the life that's lived when we ignore the truth. And it's a dark picture that ought to shake us this morning. Peter's going to show us the cost of slipping off course, the cost of slipping into false teaching. When I was in high school, my brother and I really enjoyed snowboarding, and we lived down at the bottom of the hill from Tahoe, just about an hour away, and so we'd get in the car a lot of times and go up and go snowboarding for the afternoon. And I remember one weekend very specifically, I'll never forget it, because as we were coming home down Highway 80 over the Donner Pass, out of the corner of my eye, I caught something that looked like it was flying over the guardrail. I didn't know what it was at the time, but as we got up closer, we realized there had been two vehicles that exchanged in a car accident, so they had pulled over, they were off to the side of the road discussing the accident, and there were three people standing outside the vehicle. And what had happened is, in the snowy conditions, it was below freezing, low visibility, a car had come down, a third car, Highway 80, and without seeing this incident taking place, they slid off course and plowed into both of those vehicles, essentially knocking two people over the guardrail and down the side of the hill, and the third was pinned under the second vehicle. And so we pull up and start to figure out what's going on, and we had a couple guys with us, and another car had stopped at that point. And my brother, being pretty athletic, tied a toe strap around his waist and tied off to the guardrail and made his way down there to help the guy that was down the side of the hill. And then me and a few other guys that had gathered around at that point tried to take the weight off of this vehicle to get the person that was trapped underneath the tires. And we did the best we could to help until emergency services got there and certainly CHP pulled up and invited us to leave and thanked us, you know, because of safety issues and whatnot. We got in the car and began our trip home. And I'll never forget that trip home because it was the quietest and slowest and most somber drive that I've ever had in my life. Why? Because we saw the carnage of what could happen if we weren't paying attention. We saw the tragedy that was right before our eyes that we were only feet away from if we stopped paying attention to the road, if we took our hands off of 10 and 2 and stopped looking at the highway ahead, we could so easily veer off course just as these had and so we drove carefully. It was a wake-up call and Peter this morning is going to show us the carnage, the wreckage of a car accident. He's going to paint this dark scene of what it looks like to live in the lies of Satan and to walk away from truth and to veer off course and he's saying, church, I want you to wake up. Wake up and look at the things that are around you. Pay attention. Stay on the course because if you don't, you'll veer off to the left or to the right. Don't get sucked in. False teaching is all around you. 
And by the way, it's up to you and me to avoid false teaching. It's up to us. It's not the church's job. It's not the pastor's job. It's your job. We have to look around us, be vigilant, open our eyes. So this morning is a horrifying look at the wickedness in our world and the ultimate destruction of those not walking in truth. I want to start by reading the end of the book. As um, Peter finishes 2 Peter, he, he gives us another warning. And so in chapter 3, verse 17, read with me. It says, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with error of lawless people and lose your own stability. And so he's saying, now that I've given you the warning, which we're going to get this morning, now that I've showed you how bad it could be, I've showed you the wreckage, and I've warned you against it, now you, ABC Church, as you're reading it and you're studying it now, you be careful to not get carried away. Be careful not to veer off course. Because it's possible. Because you could lose your own stability. And although we may, may feel stable this morning, we may feel secure sitting in this church in the pews and opening God's word and saying, well, I'm here because I want to follow the teaching of Scripture. Absolutely. But be careful not to get carried away, not to veer off course, not to slip. Just like the warning he gave us in 1 Peter, be of sober spirit, be alert, because the devil is a roaring lion. He's prowling around looking for flesh to devour. He's seeking you out and he's seeking me out. And so we've got to pay attention We've got to stay the course together this morning. So let's take a look at the passage here in chapter 2. We're just going to go through it verse by verse and then pull out a few key things that Peter's identifying as false teachers and false teaching. Start with me in verse 10 of chapter 2. He says, And especially those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority. Daring, self-willed, They do not tremble when they revile angelic majesties. Whereas angels who are greater in might and power do not bring a reviling judgment against them before the Lord. So Peter's firstly pointing out here this blatant wickedness. He's saying even the angels don't disregard and don't slander the other angels the way that false teachers and those walking in darkness do. And and there's a reference here even to the fact that the, the angels wouldn't be even looking down on the fallen angels, those that counteracted God's work they wouldn't even slander those ones and so a blatant disrespect and disregard for authority in verse 12 he says but these like unreasoning animals born as creatures of instinct to be captured and killed reviling where they have no knowledge will in the destruction of those creatures also be destroyed and we're going to look in a few minutes at the consequences of this lifestyle but right now I just want to point out some of the characteristics it's a disregard for authority it's living like animals barbaric uncontrolled creatures of instinct is what he's pointing out here verse 13 says suffering wrong as the wages of doing wrong they counted a pleasure to revel in the daytime they are stains and blemishes reveling in their deceptions as they carouse with you there's a shamelessness here sort of an apathy if you will it's just this blatant willingness to to just carouse in the daylight which literally is kind of this public drunkenness it's like I really don't care what people think you don't care what people say I'm going to do what I want to do and that's this lifestyle of sin that Peter is pointing to it's this carousing and verse 14 says having eyes full of adultery that never cease from sin enticing unstable souls having a heart trained in greed accursed children this eyes full of adultery literally eyes full of an adulteress with eyes on a woman that's what he's saying here that it's a constant seeking infidelity and consistently having this malicious intent and not only for their own but it's also seeking out others right it's trying to pull in the unstable people that may be drifting and that's why we need to beware this eyes full of adultery and then certainly greed this experts in greed is a trained greed like an athlete would train there's repetition that greed happens again and again and again that adultery happens again and again and again just like we talked about last week that false teaching is wrapped up in sensuality and in greed and it's everywhere in our world in verse 15 
He finishes forsaking the right way. They have gone astray, having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he received a rebuke for his own transgression, for a mute donkey speaking with the voice of a man restrain the madness of the prophet there's a little out of left field if you're reading and follow along you okay i get it false teachers there's all these characteristics and then wait balaam where did that come from we'll get to that in a second but let's just see what peter's pointing out he's honing in on these characteristics of false teachers and prophets those who walk in darkness are indulgent he says in verse 10 very clearly especially those who indulge the flesh and also despising authority again directly out of the passage verse 10 they despise authority you've got this list by the way on the outline there in front of you arrogant and slanderous verse 10 and 11 discussing the the difference between angels and how the angels wouldn't even slander there's this arrogance this aura that just continues to revel in pride and then the ignorance that we see in verse 12 that they have no knowledge captured and killed reviling where they have no knowledge will be in the destruction and certainly verse 14 adulterous and seductive and greedy and finally with the story of Balaam they have gone astray these are characteristics of a lifestyle lived in darkness of a life that's not following the truth of scripture and you might look at this list this morning and you go yeah that's pretty bad certainly I'm, I'm glad that God's redeemed me from that and I'm sitting here this morning going well this doesn't really characterize my life and maybe not even the life of people around me praise God for that by the way that you've been redeemed but let's not get off the hook so quick because Peter brings in this story of Balaam. I think there's a really important point in the fact that he introduces this now. And let me tell you why. If you look at the story of Balaam, anyone remember the story of Balaam and could tell me what was the sin of Balaam? Nobody knows what the sin of Balaam is. I mean, we look at the story and we go, okay, but what did he do? I mean, yeah, I know Balaam's donkey talked to him. I'll just give you a little insight here. Here's the overview of the story. This is what happened. If you haven't heard the story of Balaam, it's in Numbers chapter 22. Jot it down on your notes. You can go back and research it and read it later. But here's what happens. Basically, Balaam is like a sorcerer. So he's someone that would be hired for, for performing some kind of act, a curse, or different things like that. And so there's a guy, his name is Balak. So we got Balaam and we got Balak. Balak is an enemy of Israel. He feels really threatened by Israel as he sees them progressing, taking over land, and God is continuing to bless Israel and make them successful. So Balak feels really threatened. So he hires Balaam, or at least he tries to. He calls Balaam, and he says, Balaam, I want you to put a curse on Israel. I'm really concerned about the way that Israel is moving over and taking more land, and so I want you to put a curse on them. And by the way, if you do, you'll have all the riches of my palace. So he offers him a, a, an incredible sum of money, and so that's where Peter refers to the greed of Balaam right here. So Balaam's eyes get really big, and he goes, wow, okay, Balaam's, or Balak's a pretty rich guy. I think I could benefit from that. And so he goes to God knowing that God of Israel is powerful and strong. And so Balaam's really shrewd and he thinks, you know what, I'll do this, but I'm gonna first go check in with God and talk to God and make sure that I could kind of get some feel for how he's gonna treat me if I do this. And so he goes to God and God says, absolutely not, Balaam, you may not go against my people. You may not go with Balak and speak a word against Israel. Those are my people, my chosen people. And so he says, no. Balaam, not taking no for an answer, goes back to Balak and says, just give me a day, basically. Just give me, give me some time and let me go check back in. And so he gives it a night and Balaam goes and sleeps for the night. And God comes in a dream to Balaam and he says, if you must go, then go. Go with Balak. But here's one condition. You have to do only what I tell you to do. And you have to say only what I tell you to say. And you may not speak a word against Israel, so he gets the permission to go. So Balaam saddles up his donkey and he starts to make his journey to go with Balak. Still not sinful, right? He asked permission, God gave him permission. Balaam hasn't disobeyed God, but he gets on his donkey and he goes. Here's where the story gets really weird. His donkey stops, right? Stops in his tracks, drops to the ground, and won't continue on. And so Balaam starts cursing at his donkey and whipping and beating his donkey because the donkey won't move. Why won't the donkey move? Because the angel of the Lord is standing in his path and the donkey sees it, Balaam doesn't. And he's like, I'm not gonna move forward because certainly if we go past this angel, we'll die. And so finally, Balaam, after beating his donkey to death, basically, the donkey opens his mouth and speaks to Balaam 
through God's voice. And he says, why are you beating your donkey? I'm just trying to keep you safe. Okay, I'm not sure about you, but if I had a donkey that I was riding and just looked back at me and spoke to me, there's something that I better pay attention to. So Balaam gets the message. He's like, okay, I guess we're not moving forward. And he says, there's an angel of the Lord and we can't go forward. And so Balaam gets the message. And in that moment, he says one very important thing. Numbers chapter 22, he says, I have sinned. And we we start to see Balaam's heart. What was Balaam's sin? What was the sin of Balaam? It was that he never had intentions of obeying God. He was going to do what Balaam wanted to do, and he was going to try to get his way and make sure everyone else and kind of manipulate the details around him so that it worked out for him. But Balaam never intended to obey God because when he got stopped in his tracks, he realized in that moment, God is bigger than me, and he's actually seeing my motive and my intention. And he knew what Balaam was going to do. And so it was a heart issue with Balaam. It wasn't an obedience issue. He waited for permission. It was a heart issue. And I think Peter's pointing that out this morning. He's saying, you know, yeah, there's the greed aspect because Balaam wanted the money. But there's a heart issue associated with this. And for you and I to look at this list this morning and say indulgence and despising authority, ignorance, adultery, greed, people that have gone astray, you go, well, certainly that's not my lifestyle. You could look at my decisions and my choices and the things that that I do, but where's your heart? Let's not get off the hook so fast. Let's not put this list at a distance and say it doesn't describe me, and so I'm good. No, Balaam had a heart issue that Peter's addressing here. It's just like when Jesus said, it's out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. It's, it's the words that are in your heart. And David prayed, God, a, a heart that's contrite and repentant. It's not the sacrifice. It's not the act. Psalm 51, it's a broken and contrite heart. And so God's calling us to look at the heart. We have to be careful this morning as we evaluate the false messages in our world and don't dismiss your part in that because there's false teaching all around us and you and I at times maybe unwillingly or unknowingly have invited these things into our life and we need to be vigilant we need to look and we need to continue dismissing them to the left and to the right so we can stay the course and we're all here this morning to follow God's truth aren't we praise God that you're here we're here at ABC Church because we want to open his word and we want to follow the right teaching we can eliminate false teaching we don't want to know what the world has to say we want to know what God has to say and so I'm so thankful you're here but here's the problem a 35 minute message on a Sunday morning or an hour and 15 minute worship service is not enough truth for you to combat the voices of darkness in your world it won't do it this will not sustain you through the week you do not have enough truth in 35 minutes on Sunday morning to avoid all of the false teaching that you're getting from the left and the right all week long we have to counteract these voices of darkness in our life with the voice of truth and so you need to go home and you need to study it and you need to read it and you need to pray and you need to seek God and say Lord would you communicate truth to me because I don't want to hear the truth and I want to be able be able to see it and identify it when it comes and dismiss it it's up to you and it's up to me and by the way although every time I have an opportunity to share God's word I study it and I pray and I read these passages dozens of times and I ask God every single weekend Lord would you please keep me from saying anything that's not true or that's not in line with your scripture I'm a human and 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 I only have the ability to do what God has given me the ability to do and if I get into my flesh or or get a little bit off course here I have the ability to say something that's not true and so it's up to you to read the word and up to you to go home and read numbers 22 and up to you to say God what are you teaching me through scripture because I want to know the truth we've got to study God's word 35 minutes this morning isn't enough for you to counteract the voices that are in your life And again, you might say, well, I'm not listening to false teaching. I'm not following a false teacher. Well, then I would ask, well, what's a false teaching? You know, my little boy, Caden, last night when we were uh, going to bed, he said, Dad, are you teaching at church tomorrow? And I said, yeah. And he said, what are you talking about? And I stopped for a second and think, okay, false teaching. Well, I'm talking about false teaching, Caden. And he was like, what's false teaching? 
I said, well, it's teaching that's not true. So it's, it's something that's not in the Bible. It's um, an idea or a thought that someone has that's, that's not true according to what God says in the Bible. And he paused for a minute, you know, he's thinking about it, and he goes, oh. I guess he decided it wasn't interesting enough to come. To, <laughs> so he wasn't too interested. But what is a false teacher? A false teacher is anyone that opposes the truth in Scripture. It's very simple, and there's a broad category for that. A false teaching is anything that goes against what God's Word says. They are everywhere in your world. Think about for a second, what's a voice and influence in your world that opposes scripture? What are you watching on TV? What are you listening to on the radio? Because Peter is talking about adultery and sensuality and drunkenness and greed. And I don't know about you, but that sounds an awful lot like the media that we absorb every day in our world. It's everywhere. I want to read to you some disturbing statistics about media in our world today. There's false teaching everywhere. On TV, according to a 2005 study, so this is 11 years ago, it's probably worse now, I would assume. 87% of all prime time shows included sexual content. Two out of every three sexual relationships depicted on TV were outside of marriage. Two out of three. There were an average of 6.7 sexual scenes every hour on prime time TV last year. More than six sexual scenes on prime time TV last year, the following forms of violence comprised 77% of the violent and graphically violent depictions that aired during primetime broadcast on TV 14 rated shows, child molestation, rape, mutilation, disfigurement, dismemberment, graphic killings, and or injuries by gunfire and stabbings, violent abductions, physical torture, Cannibalism, burning flesh, suicide, beatings, guns, and bladed weapons, and dead bodies. 77% of shows included these things. What about music? I'll pick on country music for a second. Just because I can. Here's a Dirks Bentley song. Buying drinks for everybody but the pilot. It's a party. Got this 737 rocking like a G6. Stewardess is something sexy. Lean and pour and coke and whiskey. Told her about my condition. Got a little mile high flight attention. It's Mardi Gras up in the clouds. I'm up so high I may never come down. I'll try anything to drown. They all know why I'm getting drunk on a plane on the radio this is a false teaching this is a dark teaching this is what Peter's addressing here the drunkenness and the carousing and the sexuality this is on your radio what about video games I'm sorry guys I'm going to pick on you for a second the average video gamer in America is a 31 year old male it's not a teenager it's a fact Call of Duty, first-person shooter game. The average person playing this game kills between 75,000 and 100,000 people per year on their television screen. That means if you play Call of Duty regularly, you might be killing an average of 200 people per day. Grand Theft Auto V. I know there's been a lot of buzz in the media about this game, and so we dismiss it and go, obviously, that wouldn't be in our homes, but let me share this shocking statistic. There were 60 million copies of that video game sold. Do you realize that's 20% of the population of the United States? 20% of the homes in America have Grand Theft Auto V, and here's the description. You can drive nearly anywhere you choose and do whatever you want within this virtual reality. It includes soliciting prostitutes, driving them to a discreet location, and engaging in sexual activity with them. Then a player can make the choice to let them go or chase them down, run them over, murder them, and take their money back. 
Grand Theft Auto V players can visit a strip club anytime they want and pay for a lap dance, which involves full frontal digital nudity. Blood splatter effects occur frequently, and the game contains rare depictions of dismemberment. In one sequence, players are directed to use various instruments, clubs, and jumper cables as a means to interrogate a player. The sequence is intense and prolonged and requires player involvement. I hope that breaks your heart the way it breaks mine. I, I can't imagine these things being in our homes, these ideas. This false teaching, it's on our TV screens, it's on our video games, it's on the radio, it's everywhere around us. And Peter's saying this morning, wake up, false teaching is everywhere. You ask me what's wrong with our country, it's not the political system. It's not the presidential candidates, it's not health care, it's not our educational system, it's the fact that there is media that's infiltrating our lives and our kids everywhere around us. We're not digesting the doctrine of God. We're being indoctrinated by what we consume on television and movies, music and video games, and we are all at risk. Maybe not you, personally. Maybe not me. You may not have these things in your home, and praise God for that. I know there are a lot of people in our church that have great discipline in their homes and that are very careful to see what their children are engaged in and what they're watching and what internet sites you're going on, and I'm, I'm so thankful for that. It may not be you, but I guarantee you that someone in your world, a friend, a family member, a neighbor, a coworker, they have false teaching bleeding into their lives over and over and over again, and it's killing them, and everything is at stake and Peter's going to talk about the consequences in just a minute of a life lived apart from the truth of God and it's ultimate destruction there's no hope this is eternal destination everything is at stake and yet we blow it off and we laugh it off and we think it's funny when people talk about things Satan is desensitizing us you guys to these false teachings so that we don't even notice them anymore you might say well Just because I hear that stuff, just because I see it on TV or I hear the song lyrics, it doesn't mean that my life represents that, that that I go live that way just because I hear it or see it. No, that's that's not the, the problem is that it's become normal. That it's a normalizing process, a desensitization process that all of a sudden people begin to say things like, well, that's just what they do now. No, that's not just what they do now when people move in together before they get married or people engage in these activities or this violent crime that takes place. We go, it's just normal in our culture now and we pay it off and just say, you know what? This isn't an issue because there's other people that have bigger issues in the world. People are starving and there's reform that needs to take place and healthcare needs to be an issue and all these things and yet people are dying every single day without the message of Jesus Christ because they're believing false doctrine. You guys, it's killing us. The fate of those walking in the lives of false teaching is ultimate destruction and Peter's going to outline that for us here. Look back at the passage with me for just a minute. Verse 9, I'm going to jump back from last week, says, Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation. That's good news. We'll come back to that in a minute. But what does he say about the unrighteous? And to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment, the ultimate consequence of embracing false teaching is punishment and judgment. Right there in verse 9. He goes on in verse 12, he says, But these, like unreasoning animals, born as creatures of instinct to be captured and killed, reveling where they have no knowledge, will in the destruction of those creatures also be destroyed. Ultimate destruction is coming for those who drift off course, who listen to false teaching, who get wrapped up in the message of the world. Ultimate destruction. And this isn't temporary destruction. It's not suffering. It's not just a temporal pain. It's not a discouragement. It's not a roadblock. This is eternal, ultimate destruction for those that drift off course and walk in the lies that Satan is feeding them. One of the most concerning verses in Scripture, in my mind, is Romans chapter 1, where Apostle Paul says this in verse 21. He says, For even though they knew God, 
They did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Verse 28, and just as they did not see it fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, their gossip, slanders, and the list goes on and on and on, that God gave them over for the destruction of because they chose not to acknowledge God anymore. This is referring to people that knew God, that understood God, that understood the principles of God, people that attended a Tascadero Bible Church and that studied his word, but at some point they got drifted off course and they stopped listening to God. Everything is at stake. I pray that prayer often that David prayed in Psalm 51. He said, Don't take your presence from me and take not your spirit from me. Because the voice of the spirit, although the spirit doesn't leave us as Christians, we can turn off that voice. We can suppress it. If we listen to all these other voices over and over and over again, wake up, Peter's saying, false teachings all around you, and it's up to you to avoid it. For some of your friends and your family, everything is at stake. Let me just ask a question for you this morning. Just consider this. If everyone in this room consumed TV, music, and movies, and news, all the media, if everyone in this room consumed media at the same rate or with the same regularity as you did, what would the spiritual climate of our church be? If everyone consumed media the same way you did what would the spiritual growth and health of our church look like just think about that for a second inversely if everyone in this room prayed with the same regularity and sought God in scripture and read his word and listened to him with the same regularity as you do what would the spiritual climate of our church look like and the reason I say that is because there are some of you in this room that are prayer warriors. I know who you are. I've talked to you. Some of you are spiritual giants. You have built a life on God's foundation, on God's word, and you're trusting and believing in him. And so I ask you the question, what would it look like for our church if everyone prayed and read scripture at the same rate that you did and they consumed the truth of God at the same regularity you have? What would our church look like? Because the reason is you have to take ownership for others' spirituality as well. We need to look around us and go, man, these people are starting to slip off course. We need to look at our friends and our family and those in our community groups and in our Bible studies and go, I really need to make sure they're communicating truth because I don't hear a lot of true messages coming out of them and I'm worried there's too many influences. And so for those of you in this room that are spiritually firm and you're stable, not at risk right now of being drifted away, I ask you, would you take concern for someone else's spiritual growth it's up to you and it's up to me we need to turn off the radio and turn off the tv sell your playstation rescue someone from false teaching i have to admit as i was processing through this passage god was beginning to just kind of work in my heart and convict me i jumped in the truck as i was going home from church one day and a song came on the radio that i knew all too well and I knew all the, the, the words and so I began to just evaluate what the song was saying and the message of the song and I realized, oh my goodness, this is exactly what Peter's talking about. It's these messages that are coming right through the speakers on my radio and so I reprogrammed the presets on my radio to K-Love and K-Life and if you guys know me, that's a big deal for me. <laughs> um, I, you know, the repetition of the Christian radio sometimes gets to me but it's a small step and you might kind of laugh it off and go oh that's funny you know Jeff just needed an example or whatever but here's the thing is we've got to take some of those small steps even if it's just a little thing that seems insignificant it's music it's movies it's tv it's all these messages that are coming into our life every day and if we're digesting those more often than we're digesting truth then we're at risk of steering off course and I don't want to be desensitized I don't want to ease into the way of thinking that opposes scripture. 
I want to stay firm. I love what Peter, or excuse me, Paul says in Ephesians. He says, have nothing to do with the faultless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it's shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For it is light that makes everything visible. And this is why it is said, wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. This is good news. I know that those statistics in this message this morning it kind of feel like a downer and you can sort of get depressed and discouraged as you look at this and go, gosh, our world is so bad and there's so many things that we just got to watch out for and how are our kids going to do and we can kind of get wrapped up in all of that. But I want to share with you this morning there is hope, there is good news and Paul is saying, wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you because there is a way out. There's a light at the end of the tunnel and it's Jesus Christ and he's provided a way and Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the light life and no one comes unto the father but through me and so I'm the way listen to my teaching follow my life and I'll show you how to get there in Romans Paul says believe in your confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you'll be saved it's good news and so when you think about all these false teachings and these messages and you kind of get overwhelmed by it, you sort of get stuck in the muck of it and just go, oh my goodness, God, you need to change our culture, change our world, our country, all these things. Let's not get so discouraged in that, but let's be encouraged by the fact that Jesus provided a way out. Just like he said in this passage in verse 9, he says, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation. He will rescue us, just like we sang. Praise God for that. And then he follows, Paul says in Romans chapter 10 verse 14, how are they to hear without someone telling them? So he shares that good message, the hopeful message that if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. But how will they hear unless someone tells them? Those of you this morning that are on a great path of righteousness, those of you that are listening and digesting and reading scripture, that are following God, we need to take responsibility for someone else's spiritual journey. How will they know unless someone tells them? Avoiding teaching is our responsibility. In 2 Peter, as he finishes up the chapter, he says, the Lord is not slow about his promises as some count slowness but he's patient, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. There's good news in the midst of this, you guys. God's provided a way out. We have to be careful. Let me close by just reading this final verse in chapter 3, 17. says, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, now you know, be on guard so that you're not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadiness. We have to be careful. We have to be on alert. Wake up this morning. There's false teaching all around us. We need to continue digesting scripture, reading truth, praying to God, seeking God, and asking for him to lead us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the truth in your word. And God, it really is an amazing blessing and a privilege to get to be at a church where we can open your word and we can just read it for what it says. And God, even though it's sort of sad when we read those things, God, and when we see the, the darkness in our world contrasted with the light, God, it makes us a little discouraged. But Lord, I thank you that there is an encouraging word. There's good news that you've provided for us, God, a way out. And Lord, you're willing that none should perish. And so God, would you put us on guard? Would you heighten our senses? Would you allow us to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit and follow you, God, in what you're calling us to? God, we need to wake up. We need to see where these things are. We need to be vigilant, but we also need to focus